and will then bring those questions to the two mics at the front of the room. So uh, let me go ahead and get started with some introductions. Uh, to my right is Chris Cruson. Chris is a Penn State graduate, journalism, 1998, uh, with a lot of background in digital journalism. Didn't originally start that way, started out in newspapers, right? Senate Daily Times, uh, then in the morning call in Allentown. Eventually worked his way to the Philadelphia Inquirer as their online editor, and then to, he got his uh, interest in started by moving to Hollywood, California, and working in digital operations for Variety and Hollywood Reporter. He's now back uh, and should offer some interesting perspective as the editor of BillyPen.com. Uh, for those of you who are from the Philly area, uh, this is a new news startup operation. So uh, also to mention that I noticed on his Twitter profile today that he is, quote, mildly obsessive about digital journalism. So we welcome Chris. Uh, in the middle, Deborah Lighthouser, president and publisher of the Center Daily Times, uh, who has an interesting background because unlike a lot of publishers in the news business, uh, does not come from the business side, but from the news side. Uh, it's a long experience, two decades as a reporter and editor, uh, many of those years at the Washington Post. Uh, she joined the Senate Daily Times in January after being the editor-in-chief of the McClatchy Tribune Information Services. And Deborah is a graduate of the University of Florida and started her career there at the Orlando Sentinel. And on the end, uh, Jason Weitzel, also a Penn State graduate, Integrated Arts in the year 2000. He is the Senior manager, manager of Digital Communications for Comcast Corporation and their headquarters in Philadelphia. Formerly, uh, he had two years as their Content Services Manager for uh, those of you who are interested in sports, Comcast Sportsnets and the 11 regional websites that they have. He's also uh, a longtime newspaper veteran, 10 years, and uh, again for sports fans, the proprietor, the owner, the starter, and the eventual seller of Beer Leaguer, uh, one of the first sports blogs in the country and a very well-known one. So I want to welcome our uh, panelists. And I have a little, uh, a little quiz, I guess, for the audience. Let me start out by asking, in, get, in getting news every day, how many of you first go to a newspaper? All right, let me ask this question. Oh, we got, we got one. Very good. Okay, how many of you go to television at the appointed times, like 6 or 11, to watch a newscast? We have a few. Okay. How many of you open up your laptop and go directly to a news website that you like? Okay, fair number there. How many of you pick up your phone and go to a mobile news app? Just about. And then, uh, one last question. How many of you get uh, some or maybe even much of your news from a social media outlet? Okay. All right, very good. So uh, I just put that out there. I think all these people know this, but I wanted to point out and let you see uh, your colleagues to know that you are a piece of a very large and complicated audience for news and also for getting uh, advertising revenue. Uh, it's a big audience with uh, a wide range of places to get news. Uh, these people have to deal with all of that. So uh, let's go ahead and get, and get started. Deborah, if you would start and talk a little bit about uh, the Senate Daily Times, its challenges, and where you want to take it. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, so the Senate Daily Times, I think people think of it as a newspaper. A uh, newspaper, I have kind of a love-hate relationship with that word. Because a newspaper, I think, is often respected. It is considered a uh, credible uh, source of information for people. <laughs> but people think of it as something of yesteryear, especially those of you in this room. And that's not what the Center Daily Times is anymore. We are also on uh, you know, your, your social media connector. We are your news source. We, when you get your, you know, through your Facebook feed, when you see our stories, we are reaching people across many platforms. So, I think that that's something that all legacy media is fighting against, is this perception that we are very much touching probably a lot of you in this room today. 
um, through all these different channels. And so that, of course, is the ultimate challenge, I think, for most people in my business right now, is this bridge and this divide um, between print and digital. And to me, it's not print versus digital, because you know what? I have lots of print readers, and I love every single one of them. And I have a lot of digital readers um, from all over the nation uh, because of the attraction of reading about Penn State and Penn State sports and news. Um, and, and I value every single one of them as well. To me, it's about creating content and creating content that works across every platform. Uh, and I think that staying abreast of technology is by far the number one thing that we are looking at at the Center Daily Times and balancing those um, issues of the legacy media. You know, I have a printing press. I have uh, carriers that go out in the middle of the night and deliver a product and trying to balance that need and um, where the business is there with moving forward and being fast and nimble and all the things that we are uh, and need to be. And frankly, that technology companies are becoming journalists a little faster right now than I think journalists are becoming uh, embracing technology. And I, I think that's a really interesting place and moment and time. Uh, it's why after 20 years on the news side, I, and being a print journalist, and then I went on the Washington Post and I started uh, running their digital entertainment site, and making that change to being a digital journalist made me realize that the story I wanted to cover most was the story of my own industry and what it was going through, and that's what propelled me to say, you know what, I want to go to the business side where I can actually be in control of more of the things that are affecting my industry. Um, so that's a little bit about me and the Center LA Times and what we're focused on right now. Okay, Deborah, thank you. Uh, Chris, let me ask you to talk a little bit about the challenges of a startup uh, in a city that has a lot of media already. How many of you guys are from Philly, can I ask? You guys know what Billy Penn, the real Billy Penn is? Are you familiar with the, the colloquial name for the statue on top of City Hall? So, um, so Billy Penn right now uh, is on the content side, on the editorial side, four people, uh, myself, a community manager, um, and two reporter curators. One of them is a Penn State grad from about a year and a half ago, and the other used to cover Penn State for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Um, we are calling ourselves a mobile platform for a better Philly. So that means we're news geared towards your phone. More than half traffic on the internet these days is accessed by these to every website, not just news website. So more than half the audience for every site is here. So we decided to design our website and our interface for this first, and then have it look good everywhere else. Um, we curate content. We don't aggregate content. We don't take a story like the Huffington Post will and the New York Times and rewrite it with a catchier headline and then get all that traffic. Uh, we link straight out from our homepage. And if you go to BillyPen.com, which I hope you do often, uh, you can see how we do that. We link to the Inquirer. We link to the Philadelphia Daily News. We link to a blog. We link to Instagram posts. We link to Twitter posts. Uh, we're not trying to build another silo of, of, of reporting that's only considered credible if our institution does it. We link to everything that happens everywhere, figuring people will start their day with us. We'll have the story eventually, even if we didn't write it. Uh, from that perspective, I don't only have three content people working for me. I've got every journalist in the city working for me. Um, we have done stories like Hacking SEPTA, Seven Tricks for Riding Philly's Mass Transit System. Uh, we did a story about uh, fact-checking Philadelphia history tours uh, to see, they, they got a C, basically, in history, the, the history they were telling people. Um, and one of our reporters got a racist guide for her history tour, so we wrote that up as a piece, too. Um, we do a newsletter every day. We started, actually, with, an, with a, a Twitter feed, which has 1,700 followers now. We're growing at about 30 or 40 a day. Um, we have uh, an email newsletter that reaches about 900 subscribers. Our website's been live. Today's our third week. Uh, today's the, the birthday, the third week birthday. Um, more than half the people we're reaching are millennial. More than 75% of them are in Philadelphia, so we're hitting who we're trying to reach. Not a ton of them yet. We've been alive for three weeks, so I'll take what I've got so far. In that time, we've gotten a homepage link from the Huffington Post and links from the Washington Post and Talking Points Memo, as well as the Inquirer slash philly.com um, and a slew of websites through the city. I'm fairly happy with how we're going so far. Um, in terms of how are we going to make that a business? The answer to that is a little bit complicated. Uh, for now, we're hoping for, uh, we have native advertising up and running on the site already, but that's kind of pennies dependent upon the audience. Um, we're hopeful that advertising will be no more than half of our revenue, but we just took a meeting yesterday with the biggest ad agency in Philadelphia where uh, they're starting to line up clients to hear about us, so we're sort of on the path there. Uh, we're also hoping to get money from our users, but not through a paywall. 
we're trying to create communities of interest on the site and then have events around those. And when it, I say events, it's kind of less like swipe your, swipe your ID here and then things like this, honestly, and more like happy hour at a bar with the newsmaker or a chance to network with the people that we're finding are, are, um, are making an impact in the community. The number one piece of content that we published so far was a list of who's next, 18 people shaping Pennsylvania politics. And by far, it was the best thing that we've done in terms of a readership. Um, so that's what we're trying to do right now. Um, like I said, our audience uh, is growing rapidly. We had a 98% page view growth week over week, week one to week two. This is a little bit less of a page view week because there's no election this week. Um, but for now, um, I'm fairly happy with how we're going. Honestly, this is like the most fun I've ever had in my life. I've, I've straddled the bridge that Deborah talks about. It's a lovely bridge. I am so glad I'm not doing print anymore. I cannot even tell you. Okay, well, let's also now move to uh, Jason Weitzel, who is out of print, uh, but also in a different news uh, environment than he has been before, and, and it's a different field that I think is just beginning to sort of come on the scene, at least yeah, I think so. It's a, it's a, growing, uh, it's a growing industry. I, um, I work for Comcast, and my job is to get people to like Comcast. Um, which is kind of a Sorry. it's kind of a tough it's kind of a tough job these days. But um, in 2012, Comcast um, rebranded itself, um, and this came on the heels of our purchase of NBC Universal. So Comcast, which was traditionally a cable company and also an internet company, suddenly got into the media and entertainment space by buying NBC Universal, and NBC Universal's NBC Broadcast. It's Bravo, it's USA Network, it's also Universal Pictures, which is uh, Fast and Furious uh, movies, and E.T., and Jaws, and that whole legacy. Um, and it's, it's also Sportsnet, it's uh, NBC Sports, and Golf Channel, and Comcast Sportsnet. Um, so we had an interesting story to tell. We weren't just this one-dimensional company anymore, and they decided to build uh, a brand newsroom for Comcast. And um, that's, that's what I uh, head up, is the digital newsroom for Comcast, where we maintain the website, we have a blog, we have a the at Comcast Twitter handle, and we have a very high velocity of content. You wouldn't think that there's a lot of content coming out of companies, but there's a ton. And um, our audience is very different than the audience for Center Daily Times and Billy Penn. Largely, we probably don't necessarily care about reaching the people in this room. Our audience is influencers, it's investors, it's uh, people in the tech community. We want to be seen as innovators. Um, we do get a fair share of consumers at, um, on our site and we're glad to have that. And we, we direct them to the right place, but um, it is a very, very different situation. We're also not bound by advertising. Um, we, we don't have ad stacks on the right rail of our site. Um, and we also have um, the ability uh, to do some, some innovative things on social, like, uh, like brand, uh, paid social is something that we're really getting into now to, to share our content. So that's, that's a lot of what the, the, the strategy is right now. It's also a big place to talk policy, and there's a lot of that right now with Comcast. Um, you can read about all that stuff uh, on the site. Okay, great, thanks. Well, let me uh, get started and I invite you to uh, come forward with your questions, but I had one I wanted to put first to Deborah and Chris, and that has to do with making money. And uh, I looked up some numbers. Uh, advertising uh, accounts for 69% of all the revenue from news operations around the country. It's average television, digital, and print. Uh, and of News revenue, still, 58% is made uh, in print and digital by newspapers, something I think people may forget. That's a lot of money to try to uh, both manage or risk letting go of if you're going to go all digital. At the same time, in a startup operation, at some point, uh, you've got to have some revenue coming in to have sustainability. So, Deborah, first talk a little bit about your strategies for uh, keeping and growing uh, money as well as audience, and I'll ask Chris to talk about the same thing. Sure. Um, you know, crossing over to the business side was obviously eye-opening to me, but one of the things that was eye-opening is that newspapers are profitable still, which is a great thing, and it gives us um, the ability to 
figure out where to put uh, our resources. So the Center Daily part, Times is part of the McClatchy Company. The McClatchy <coughs> Company is uh, you know, heavily looking into innovating. They just sent me to Stanford University for a week to learn about design thinking and bring that back and try to infuse that throughout the company. I mean, we know that we have to change because our revenues are changing. Um, luckily, we already are, are well down that path um, of taking, um, you know, we, uh, our revenues and turning them into digital-only revenues. We keep track of that number very closely. Um, I can quote that number to you, not that I will, at any given time. But, you know, we have double-digit growth in our digital-only strategies. And that, obviously, for, it, it's all focused on your phone. Uh, just as Chris was saying, it's all about... How do we reach people on mobile? What does that mean? How do we bundle mobile into every buy? And mobile brings tremendous opportunities for newspapers. And in fact, uh, not last week, the week before, I actually had a seminar for local business people to come in and let me teach them about what they're missing if they just think of us as um, print advertising. Um, we had a, a seminar where we had a speaker come in, and he's talking to them. Um, not about things that he, they should purchase with us, although we certainly can help them with their reputation management, with their Google Plus page, which is going to directly affect whether or not they're found when someone is searching them on Google. Um, and that Making sure they understand all the different ways that, that we sell advertising. Making sure they understand that we don't just sell advertising on centerdaily.com or our tablet or apps. We sell advertising through audience extension programs. I can sell advertising all over um, the area on different websites. Um, we sell through Yahoo. We have partners uh, with a bunch of different audience extension um, brands that are out there. We also can geo-target. So let's say that you are a car dealer and you want to advertise um, right around your competitors. We can geo-target people that are on their phones, depending on how your, your settings are on your phone. And we can serve, if you're at the Ford dealer, we can serve the Mazda dealer's ads to you. And so we have a lot of technology that can help us customize, because that's the future of, I think, advertising and your news experience is that everybody wants it to be personal, right? You go on your Facebook, you go on your Twitter, you go on your phone, and we have tremendous opportunities to figure out how to do that in the advertising realm um, that far go beyond just what we can do um, through print or through just advertising on our own website. So there's a lot of opportunities there. Um, I think the big challenge for newspapers is training their staffs, training the local communities, and that's part of why we brought that, we had that seminar for our advertisers. I think that that's really important that they <coughs> do see us not just as that newspaper, like I was saying earlier, but as that content solution that drives eyeballs so that their advertising can also be very effective. So our challenge is a little bit different, obviously. Um, I don't need to try to hit everybody in Philadelphia. There's 1.4 million people in the city of Philadelphia, and I think 6 million in the metro area, which is what the TV stations like to say they reach. They really don't, but they say they do. Um, I have to worry about millennials in the city of Philadelphia. That's our target market. We're aiming for people who are under age 35. Um, aiming for a specific audience and a specific time of their lives and a specific device really tightens up the things you can offer to an advertiser. We're just starting to make that pitch now. We tell people we're not going to be BuzzFeed, we're not going to be the biggest thing in the city. You don't want to hit everybody in the city, you want to hit millennials. Why should they care about millennials? Millennials, there are more millennials in America than there are boomers. For the first time it's crossed that generational gap. This is the, the audience that has um, time and attention and money and all of them are here. I think 84% of people would rather use their phone than brush their teeth. A certain, a, a scary percentage of these use these at ridiculously inappropriate times. Um, so we know that people are spending their time there. We're trying to figure out what kind, the, the fact that we can serve you an ad wherever you are is amazingly powerful, right? In moment advertising, when you're watching an event, something can be offered to you while you're doing that is a crazy uh, technology that nobody's even really starting to just scratch the surface of how to use. Um, we're going to start exploring things like that. The other thing that we're going to try to do are events, our live events in the city. Um, sponsorship for those events is probably where we're going to wind up making a serious chunk of, of money. We, uh, our CEO, Jim Brady, who used to work at the Washington Post as well, actually, uh, spent some time at the Texas Tribune, which makes, I want to say, more than a million dollars a year on events. I mean, that's profit. That's not the, the amount of money they bring in. So they have one big event where they make most of that money, but for the most part, that's a significant revenue stream and if we take a part of that, and we have a pretty small staff with not a lot of high overhead, and we don't have to kill a lot of trees, um, we can probably realize a significant you know, 
potential revenue from that source. And Jason, a question for you. You touched on it just in the end of your initial uh, conversation. You mentioned placing information or news about Comcast on social media, which is, I think, getting into the area of native advertising in a way, but also using uh, new forms of media for communication that is specific to a company's message. Can you talk about strategies there or what you see as a potential? Sure. Um, well, I, could, I guess we could start by how we would define success in uh, a brand newsroom um, where we're trying to hit an, an influencer audience. Um, so a great example happened today where Comcast announced a new uh, talking guide for, and it's, it's, it's geared toward blind or low light vision um, users where you guide through your television shows and it, it talks through the guide. It tells you what the show is, uh, how long it's going to be on. It's a new product and it's, it's the first of its kind. And I'm, I'm excited about it. I'm not just the PR guy saying I'm excited about it, but we did a press conference on it where our CEO announced it and we had our VP of Accessible Technologies demonstrate it. And we supported that announcement through a series of feature articles that I wrote and some infographics that I designed and, and some photography that we took. And we had all of these assets available for reporters ahead of time. So we pitched them the story. They knew that it was, that it was going to happen. And a number, of, a number of outlets, CNN Money, the Boston um, Herald, um, Washington Post, I think, Ars Technica maybe, uh, used some of our assets in their stories. So they embedded video that we provided to them. They linked to our stories. That's a win. That's how we define success, is if we can influence the, the discussion and we can help in those stories um, and get them infographics or imagery at a social size that, that their reporter can put on Twitter, that's what, that's what we're there to do. We're really not there to drive traffic back to us. And, and a, a win for us is if our homepage becomes CNN money for a day or the, the homepage of the Boston Herald or, or whatever the news outlet is, that's a win for us. It's, um, it's not about driving traffic back to the water site. Um, and we're experimenting, like I said, through, through paid social. And that's, um, it, it could be stories that we wrote or stories that are favorable about Comcast that, that, we, um, that we, we surface in, in, on Twitter. So. And you're finding a, uh, a pretty good audience there? Do you, do you uh, keep track of the, the traffic? Yeah, it's, it's, I, think, I think it's your new homepage, right? It's, and I think every, at the, you're, you ask where people get their news from, and, and I get my news mostly from social media. I get it from Facebook, and it's ambient. I don't really even recall where I heard the news. Um, I, I, perhaps from Philly.com, perhaps from NBC, NBC News. Um, you just you're just receiving it all the time, and you see it. It's repetitive, and and you just kind of absorb it. Um, so, anytime you can get your story in front of uh, people that way, where they just they're just sort of absorb it, absorbing it without even knowing it, and that's that's where you have to be. And that's why home pages and everything like that. It's every page is a home page. Your Twitter is your home page. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what people are seeing. Okay, good. Let's uh, go to the audience for some questions. All right. Anybody got a question to start? Always takes a little while for somebody to go for the first one. Can I ask, what do you guys want to do? Like when you, if, if, for those of you who are journalism majors, just show of hands. How many want to work in, like, go work for a newspaper? How many of you want to work for a TV station in some way, shape, or form, whether it's broadcast or cable? How many of you want to work for a digital outlet, like a Huffington Post, Business Insider, or something like that? What are the rest of you going to do? PR. Sorry, PR. Okay. Anything I'm missing? Law school? Politics? Acting? Okay. Entrepreneurs. Anybody want to start their own business? Join a startup? It's a hell of a lot of fun. A little scary, but a lot of fun. Okay, thanks. Well, I'll ask, uh, while you're waiting with uh, question ideas, let me ask the follow-up, and that is to all of you, which is, what do these people have to do to get ready to do those jobs? Uh, what are you looking for? 
either now or what do you think you're going to need uh, down the road uh, out of college? I mean, I would say that the number one thing I need are, um, I mean, I need, because I'm over, you know, the newsroom and advertising and, and all of the above, I, I think that I need people that are nimble. I need people that are tech savvy. I need people that understand the value of content and storytelling. And I need, peop I need salespeople too. I mean, and I need people that can go out and understand that well enough to uh, be able to share the value proposition with a potential advertiser. I, I need, certainly I need evangelists in the newsroom that can go out and, and sell the importance of what we do. Uh, I do think that in newspapers today, uh, it's important that their leadership be a big part of the community. Um, and that's when I'm looking for, to hire someone. I am looking for not only are they going to be a good fit in the Center Daily Times, but will they represent my paper well when they're out there uh, interviewing? I, you know, because we really need to be covering those local stories. You get those local stories by cultivating sources and having conversations, whether they're with readers or advertisers or wherever. You really need people that have their ear to the ground and can come back and help you share the stories about your community. And that's the most important thing for me is to having people that are really rooted and understanding the value and sharing um, the community <coughs> stories. Uh, you know, sometimes the community's gonna love you for it, sometimes they're gonna hate you for it, that's just part of it too. Um, and I, I hope they hate you for it at times because it means you're out there doing the, the, the right journalism, right? Um, but you, uh, you just need people that are inquisitive and I think nimble is really a, a key thing right now. Um, it's hard for me to walk out into my newsroom and if I said to someone, uh, hey, I need you to go cover this story and I need you to take the pictures and can you uh, quickly you know, get something up on social media and that they understand that it's not about that print product anymore. I mean, when we start talking about stories now, especially we just hired a new editor a few weeks ago who's got a real big digital background, you know, we're talking about the story cycle completely different. News breaks, let's get um, up a news alert, right? And then you're looking to get something up on the website, let's get it on Facebook. Print's kind of the last part of that equation, and I think hiring people that understand that it's a whole different ball game out there is really important for me. Um, well, we just hired not too long ago. Uh, both of our uh, reporter curators started about a month ago. Um, I had two jobs, and so I interviewed about 14 finalists. I put the job opening out through my Twitter account. Um, I got all my candidates that way. Um, I had two openings, and so it's such a small team. We all had to work so well together. We actually did the interviews survivor style. We had both candidates in the same interview with the big group. Um, the ones that couldn't handle that, it, that, clearly we weren't the place for them. The ones that could were the ones we hired. Um, both of those uh, reporter curators that we hired were not the most experienced people in the world, but both of them were incredibly curious. One of them, um, her, uh, her application was a, was a video. Uh, she once told a story using only Vine. Um, and that was exact, and, and the other person we hired just finished working on a database, and he was a, a print reporter for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, but he had just finished a database project. And that's the kind of people that we've been looking for. I would say for Billy Penn, the next person we hire I think will be an events person. Um, after that, probably a, a full-time developer. Um, when and if we wind up getting funding, which is the other part of a startup, we're, we're a bootstrap startup, which means Jim Brady basically, uh, my boss, put aside a certain amount of money to, to pay for operations with the staff that we have for about a year and a half. But hopefully, far before then, we have found investors who believe in what we're doing, at which point we'll expand to a larger newsroom and start doing more original content. Um, when I do hire, I'm still going to look for people who can do everything, who can both, uh, when you curate Billy Penn, and if you've gone to the site, and I hope you have, you'll see what we put on social is pretty much what we put on the site. So one person will run the site while the other people go out and report great stories. So I need people who can do that, who can think socially, who can think about what's going to be shared, who can think of great headlines, better headlines than you're seeing in the other media in Philadelphia. We're finding that's not a hard thing to do, frankly, write engaging, interesting headlines because everybody else is too busy pumping out insane amounts of content every day, we're able to sort of step back and figure out what and that really needs to be sold and then driving that home um, on social and on our site. Uh, so I need people who can think like that, who can think like um, storytellers, hey, did you hear this, in a way that's primed and optimized for social media because the social media that drives the most content traffic to websites is Facebook, by far, far away, bigger than Twitter, bigger than everything. Why? Two billion people on Facebook. More people on Facebook than anything else. The most used app on the mobile phone is Facebook. People spend two and a half hours a day on Facebook. So it's super important to get that audience and be ready for where that's coming from. 
I think versatility, especially at your age, um, to, to, to go and, you know, you have, I don't know how many years you have left, but go in one of the labs and teach yourself Photoshop for a couple of nights. You know, just having that tool in your back pocket, I think, is really a, a key thing. Um, and being nimble, I, I, you know, if, if you have the chance to work at a, at, at a newspaper, particularly a small newspaper, where you're tasked with doing a lot of things. I worked at a weekly We're newspaper. hiring. They're hiring. Um, I, I worked at a, a weekly newspaper out of college where I was a section editor. I laid out the pages. I covered township meetings. I did all of this in a week. I unloaded the skids that had the newspapers on them. Like, I did all of that stuff. Um, and it just, it, and it's, and the paper struggled, and paper struggled. So there was a hunger there that drives everybody to do it. And you don't get paid a lot. But you learn your craft and and you write, and I think that's another key thing. Is especially you know, the journalism majors just write, just write and write and write and write. Just find something you like to write, and you're you know you're in college and you're you're, you're seeing a lot of different things, and you're eventually going to find something that you're really passionate about. I did with the Phillies, and I started a blog about them in 2003, and I wrote all the time about nothing but the Phillies, and it just after you find that, it's, it's something just happens, and, and you become good at your craft with regards to writing. So you'll eventually find all that. But I think at first, just to be versatile, I think is really key. Okay. And I would add to that to read as well. Um, you know, as you're writing, that's great, but you should also pick, I think, a few great reporters or people that you really admire and just read and really analyze the reporting and writing because that's just going to be critical no matter what field you go into because good writers are needed whether you're a lawyer or whether you uh, are a journalist or whether you're you know somewhere and you need to just write a great memo for your boss uh, that's just something that will pay off hugely down the road okay let's go to questions Annie you start this is on this is on okay um, so it feels like as students uh, especially uh, in journalism we're being taught that we need to learn 20 different things, um, you know, writing, multimedia, video, audio, coding, what, what have you, social media. Um, so it's always, it's a little confusing sometimes, you know, which direction we should focus on or what we should focus on. Um, so if you could say, you know, and I've heard all three of you say different things, writing, reading, uh, everything. Um, what would be the what would you think the the main thing the main thing is as students um, in four years that we should try to do? I think the main thing you should try to do is get experience, and I know that that's just as broad as all those things you were saying. But you know, people that graduate and have a couple of papers from classes um, are, are not the people that are going to get jobs. Be the people that can tell me. I went and spent a semester at the Center Daily Times or wherever um, and actually got enough practical experience that then they can decide where they want to focus. Whether or not, it's not that they took a couple pictures for class, it's that they actually were a photo intern and went out and decided, wow, this is the completely wrong thing for me. And I think that experience that you can get, and I think a lot of students think, oh, my job right now is to go to school, and they get some experience, but they don't really dive deep into getting that experience. And I think that's what's going to set you apart, and that's what's going to answer that question that you're asking. Because you're, it's, it's a lot of chaos out there, right? It is. Like, how do you, uh, you know, what do you focus on? And I think that the only way you're going to answer that is to really find what, you know, your passion is, just like he was talking about writing. Um, that's, uh, for me, that was editing was the thing. I, I enjoyed writing, but when I first started editing other people's work, which for me was actually in high school, I was like, wow, I'm really good at taking a crappy B minus story and making it an A plus story. And I knew I was better at that than I was even at writing. And I could consistently, I feel like, write a pretty good, you know, B, B plus, A minus kind of story. But I was really good at, at taking other people's work and elevating it. And that helped me figure out, oh, I'm good at this writing thing, but I'm really good at this editing thing. And it helped me focus on where I wanted to go. So, that, and that was just experience that got me to that point. Yeah, my question's for Chris, uh, looking at Billy Penn right now, actually, and I was wondering, uh, how do you decide what's top, what, what tops the stories? Like, is it the most hits on a story, or is it something that you feel is 
uh, most important or because I mean the hits don't really matter for, for that website they don't matter for your website so what do you cho- how do you choose what goes first so right now Billy Penn by the way if you go to it we don't have a typical home page we don't have a centerpiece three or four pictures that you slide through and then a sidebar we have we, it's a stream Right now, it's actually the most recent content. So the most recent thing we published, just like a blog, is the first thing that's on there. Uh, coming in about a week or so, we'll be able to make a post sticky. In other words, make it stick at the top of that stream. But it's meant to be reverse chronological, just the most recent thing that we publish, at least for now. Because we don't get most news web pages, by the way, most of their traffic is not coming to the home page. It's coming to the articles. Um, the, the New York Times did an innovation report, which I'm sure your professors pointed out to you when it happened about a year ago, I guess. Uh, and they described the slow death of the homepage. What that means is more people are finding New York Times stories, obviously, through social and through search than they are through the homepage. So therefore, we decided why would we spend too much energy worrying about what a homepage is going to look like. Um, also, ideally, we'd like to personalize that stream so that we will eventually know what you've looked at, not just on our website, but on other websites, and serve you stuff you haven't seen before. That's why we're, we're doing it that way. But for right now, it's just the most recent thing that we published. And the most recent thing that we published could be an Instagram photo, a link to one of our stories, something on the Inquirer, philly.com, a blog, whatever. That's right now, we just, it's, it's whatever we just did. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chris, and I think you've done a great job at explaining how you compete with the larger markets. Maybe if you want to expand a little bit more, but how does the Center at LA Times and bigger companies and more established companies like Comcast, how do you compete with you know the startup companies and everyone has a voice today in today's society, whether it's on Facebook, anyone can create their own blog. So how do you guys compete with those startups and make sure that your voice is heard overall? Uh, I think that's a great question. I think that um, typically when you ask in any media market, you know, the brand they trust the most is still often the Center Daily Times or the newspaper brand, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's a huge benefit for companies like mine. Uh, The McClatchy Company owns um, the Miami Herald, the Sacramento Bee, you know, a lot of papers that are in um, their state capitals. We are, are respected. And I think that that is something that you can absolutely capitalize on. At the same time, um, you know, I, I've had people in this town that where the Center Daily Times was bought by Knight Ritter many years ago, and people were like, oh, the corporation came in and they ruined it. And in some ways, being a part of that corporation is a huge benefit for my company because I am able to um, take advantage of the latest in mobile offerings because we're buying them. Oh, there's an economy of scale there, right? And they're pushing them down to all the papers. And so I have some of the latest mobile technologies. I have some of the latest mobile partnerships out there that allow me to sell um, and and do things that, you know, the local startup just is not going to have that kind of reach. They're not going to have, um, not only can I display ads on my site, but I can also target users that are going to the Miami Herald site that are, have interest about Penn State. Like I can follow them and I, I, that network <coughs> and that ability and our partnerships with Google and Yahoo and all those kind of things I think are, are what make my brand um, still really resonate. And I think it's also, you know, a, a newspaper is about the relationship it has with its community. Um, you know, I serve on boards locally. I try to get out. I'm actually going to have a column in the paper soon in which we're inviting readers to come down and kind of have informal coffees with us, right? Because we need to be having that conversation with our readers. Um, and that's something that I think we can afford to do and people want to come out still and, and be a part of the newspaper and capitalizing on that so that we can really understand our reader and user better is, is, is going to be key. I think it's a different challenge for Comcast. You're kind of asking me, how do you cut through the noise? And our challenge is it's a PR exercise. So, you know, one of the things we do is kind of good old fashioned, we have a PR team and we reach out to the reporters that cover us and we form a relationship and we keep them informed and we keep an honest relationship and a dialogue and give them the tools that they need to write a story accurately. Um, so that's that's one of the ways that I think, and again, it's our our, our home page could be the home page of, of the New York Times or whoever's writing about us that day. We really don't care. Um, I mean, the other thing I think, too, is one of the benefits of Comcast is we can leverage the enterprise. And what I mean by that is we own eOnline.com and we own NBCSports.com and at NBC Sports. So, and that's an important thing, not necessarily in our product discussion, but 
in things that we do for the community, and that's another one of the topics that we, we report on, on in the brand newsroom is what we do in the community with Comcast Cares Day, with Boys and Girls Club of America. We have a big announcement tomorrow that we're, we're doing with Boys and Girls Club. Um, so we have partners all throughout the NBC uh, network and the enterprise that we can tap into to get that story out who have way more followers than, than at Comcast does. And Comcast is an interesting brand. We have at Comcast, we have the Xfinity brand, which is our product brand, which has more followers and, a, and I think a more positive um, relationship with consumers. And then all of our other brands in, in the NBC Universal uh, realm. Um, you mentioned the traits that you look for and how important it is to have experience, but I'm wondering what advice you have for any graduating seniors, because I know I'm graduating in like a month, um, on how to stand out on paper, because you can put down a bunch of you know, really cool experiences you've had. I had an interview and it was kind of overlooked and I had to mention it in the interview and they're like, oh, you had this internship. And it's like, that was actually in the interview, but a lot of people are applying online and they're applying without that face-to-face, -face, so how do you stand out on paper? Like, how do you beat other people graduating to it? I think the way you stand out on paper um, <coughs> is not through your resume. Um, it's through your cover letter. Uh, I remember I was hiring once for this job at the Washington Post, and whenever you post a job at the Washington Post, you get hundreds <coughs> and hundreds of resumes, right? And I remember going home one night because like, I didn't have time to do this at work and I had all these resumes like all over the bed. My husband's like, we're never going to sleep tonight. I'm like, oh no, I'm getting through. And I remember the cover letter that I picked up and it made me laugh out loud. It was funny. It was so well done. It was completely targeted to the job that I was trying to hire. And I still, I still have it. And I wrote yes at the top of it and I circled it and I hired him and he's still an editor at the Washington Post. And I still have it in my files as the best cover letter that has, uh, I've ever gotten. And that really, he took the time to figure out you know, how he could best communicate. It was short, and it was sweet, and it was like to the point, but laugh out loud funny. And for the job I was hiring for, that was kind of exactly the voice that I needed. Your cover letter is where you can really let your voice shine through. And if we want to be writers and you don't have a voice, then like what is it that you're selling? So you know, you, I would really strongly look at that cover letter and, and try to make it um, stand out among the crowd. So you recommend like taking the risk? Like, oh, what I, if it wasn't I funny? Ask, what if you I didn't have that risk, humor? And it wouldn't be you know, cheesy about it. I remember I had a friend once, she was in advertising and she sent somebody a broken chain and her cover letter was like, I'm your missing link. And I was like, oh my gosh, I roll. But <laughs> she got the job, so it worked for her in this, in this uh, realm. But I think, um, you know, at your cover letters where you can point out that stuff is really interesting in your uh, resume that might be lost at the end or, or that kind of thing. Um, but I've had really amazing cover letters cross my path, and, and when that happens, that's, that's really great. I also think if you can, like, reach out through LinkedIn, search people, like, you know, it is amazing to me. Stop. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just sitting here right now, I'm like, oh, I know Jim, and he knows Jim, and like, we are, you know, it's six degrees of separation, right? And finding that person that can get you that introduction is huge, too. No, I was just going to say, like, recently, like I said, I had the, one of the people who got a job sent me a video cover letter, so it was definitely right. not your average, that made it stand out. Look, it... Everybody else who's applying for the job is thinking just like you are. Should I really take that risk? Be the one who does. Yeah. Hi. Um, so because digital journalism is based on ad revenue, what if you have a mega ad contract with a company and that company has done something really immoral? Would you not post a story or kind of like go kind of silent about the story and not go too far into it because you're afraid that they won't give you money anymore or anything ethical like that? Um, we would publish a story like that. I mean, that's, that's you know, obviously it happens, all, you know, quite often, right? I mean, Penn State had a big scandal. My number one advertiser is actually Penn State University. It doesn't mean that we wouldn't cover that story that was going on. Um, and I think that if you're going to have credibility and the respect that we talked about earlier, you just have to make those calls. And um, it's... It's a challenge, I think, for journalism as the you know revenue streams and everything else change. I mean, I, I but I think like if you have the right people at the helm, if you have publishers with clear uh, compasses, um, which I'm very 
grateful that my company, the McClatchy Company, as you mentioned earlier, I'm kind of the anomaly, right? I came up from the news side, right? So these calls are a little, maybe a little easier for me to make, even though it, it's not easy, right? But typically, you know, what your news operation is doing is separated from what your advertising department is doing, and I might be the only person that knows about the conflict that's going on. And that's really how it should be. And most of the time, you know, I don't even necessarily get brought in because news knows what it needs to do, and advertising knows what it needs to do. And so for us, that, um, you know, is that your reputation is what you stand on, and if you, you know, the community can't trust you to cover a story, and you know, trust me, the community's gonna second guess everything you do anyway, but so you just really have to have that line and know where it is and that you're not gonna cross it, so. Okay, let me ask you a question. Uh, we already touched on this a little bit, but I think it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, you talk about Facebook as being a huge driver of traffic. <laughs> Facebook is not necessarily a benign place to go, I've been reading, uh, in the sense that they derive a lot uh, from the content that's placed on there by uh, its members, uh, links to you, but also uh, it just makes Facebook that much more popular. Um, do you see a downside to participating too much in Facebook? Um, the practical answer is no, because you have to go where the audience is. The, the answer I heard over, I went to the Online News Association conference in Chicago about a month ago. Uh, a guy named Tony Hale gave a really great speech that you should look up about uh, the attention people pay to things and the difference between Twitter and Facebook. And um, his example was over the summer, Twitter, the big story on Twitter was Ferguson and what was happening with the shooting. Um, and the protests in Ferguson. And the big story that was happening all summer, as I'm sure you saw on Facebook, was the Ice Bucket Challenge. <laughs> womp womp. One was news, the other was definitely not, right? Um, so that's because Facebook is controlled by an algorithm. Uh, Facebook stories stick around for so long because the number of times those stories are interacted with are what keeps it there. So an experiment, next time you want to share something you want a lot of people to look at, phrase it in such a way on Facebook, on your own Facebook, as if you had gotten engaged, gotten a new job, or had a kid. If you say things like that when you write a post and just link to a news story, that story will do better than if you just wrote, here is a link to a story that I like in my local paper. Why is that? Because it's algorithmically driven. Facebook is looking for posts like that to elevate them and make them stick up higher in your feed. That's why when you scroll through Facebook and you see stuff again and again and again, it's because your friends are liking it and commenting on it. That's why it works that way. There's an absolute danger in that, and, and you have to be careful, I think, as a news organization, not to pander and not to write things only with the pure intent of being shared, but by the same token, to ignore where a huge portion of your audience is would just be irresponsible, I think, as a publisher. So you've got to be able to balance the editorial, the need to have, the need to have an audience for what you do, and the ability to, to maintain your editorial independence. Add something about Facebook, <coughs> Facebook too, that I think has been liberating to newspapers, and this is the challenge that we wrestled with at my newspaper back in 2006, 2007, where we were just starting to get into digital, and it was the idea of the comments thread, right? <coughs> so you have a sensitive topic to write about, and we're, this is back where we're in the mindset of, we want the conversation to live on our website. We want to make our website a destination for everything. Everything, Berks County, everything, Center Daily Times, like all the topics, we want this to be the home base where everyone talks about it. And, you know, we opened up the comments. It was 2007, 2008. You know, it gets kind of ugly. It's anonymous. Everyone in the industry is trying to figure out what to do with comments. There's no good way to police it. You have to register. It's, it's a big thing. The thing that Facebook has done is it's taken that conversation back to Facebook, and you have your ID right there. So it's cleaned the dialogue up a little bit. Um, but it's not necessarily, I think, I think sites have gone away from they have to be the place where everyone comments, and they've figured out ways where the comments thread can actually be powered by Facebook or by Google Plus or, or, or something like that. So it's been an interesting evolution with Facebook and, and news. And, and I think it's more than just Facebook. I think it's Google. I think it's all of them out there. I mean, to me, they're all frenemies, right? Uh, they're both friends and enemies uh, where you just, you know, but. It, it's where the audience is. You do need to be there. Um, to me, if I wasn't there, I think that would be saying something weird. Um, but I think I, I do look at them. I read those stories. I, I try to gauge, and I, it's going to change. As it's changed, you know, in all these years. Uh, and I think that's where that nimbleness, you know, comes out in my future workplace. Right? I want 
I want to hire people that are going to alert me to be like, hey, did you know Facebook is doing this new thing? And maybe then I elevate it and it's part of the corporate conversation and we just decide to do something different. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's a necessary thing now. We certainly do get traffic back from us. We serve ads when they link over to us. I mean, there's, there is that relationship, but it's constantly changing with Facebook, with Google, with all of them. And I think that you just need to be aware of that. Uh, I think for all of you, let me ask a question on the issue of rather than the news organization, the article, the individual story becomes what is read, what is moved, and, and what is talked about. Uh, and I think a lot of that is driven by, by social, but do you focus on that as a new way of producing and, and putting out news? It's no longer about your organization, it's about an individual article, or, or in the case of, of Comcast, an individual uh, report announcement, press release, whatever that you want to get out there that has to be seen and has, has to live out there for a while. Um, we certainly try to think of ideas that are shareable. Um, you know, set the idea of hacking SEPTA or, you know, 10 things, the, the idea of an explainer, really, which we've done, I want to say, seven or eight kind of explainers. We have these things we call, like, you know, uh, Bill Cosby 101, why everybody's talking about rape these days, and we just go back through all of, of what's happened and explain it in, in kind of a Q&A type format. We've done it for SEPTA's new payment system, uh, the state of public education in Philadelphia, um, the pornographic email scandal in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, by the way, has been awesome for news these days. Like, we've got lawmakers shooting each other in Harrisburg, and our judges are retiring because they've been emailing hundreds, hundreds of pornographic emails. It's kind of a great time to work in news in Pennsylvania. Um, so we've tried to explain all those things. So obviously, we weren't around from the beginning of all these things, right? But we try to catch our users up. Those things are designed, yes, to be shared, to be uh, passed around to other people. To, to and, and actually, the piece that we just did, um, yesterday we published a piece where chefs from eight of Philly's top restaurants told our uh, freelance writer where they get their cheesesteaks and their piece of pizza and their tacos in Philadelphia. Um, that has been the most shared thing on Facebook that we've done yet, after the Who's Next list. Yeah, I mean, the article is the key. It, and for us, it's articles or campaigns. We, we do product announcements or we do uh, big initiatives with, with, with community organizations. And it's, it's, about, it's about leveraging that piece of content as, as much as you can. And like I, I was saying before, we're doing a lot of paid social. And um, it's, it's all about the headline these days because you know, we're putting our content on things like Outbrain. Outbrain, I'm sure you've seen what Outbrain is. Does, does anyone know what Outbrain is? You know what Outbrain is, Chris? You know what Outbrain is. So when you're on an, a website and you're finished reading the article, you get all kinds of links to less than savory articles kind of below it. We recommend the side boob archive on Rihanna or whatever is at the bottom of those all those web pages that you look at. That's that's Outbrain. Oh, that's Outbrain. Um, we're not targeting those sites in particular with Comcast content, um, but we are changing our headline um, to fit a more general general audience um, through things like Outbrain. So yeah, it's, it's about how far a piece of content can travel and changing it along the way so it reaches the target audience. And, and, and you're looking at all this stuff through data. I mean, what, in this business, you really want to be on Google Analytics and, and Adobe and, and, and anything else that you can um, gain information by where your content is traveling and um, learn more about your audiences. Like, for example, a great audience for us is Google+, Plus, which is a, a niche social media outlet which people are dropping off of. They're not really funding it anymore. It's, it's, Google's pulled all their development resources away from it for other things. But we found that uh, people visiting our site from Google Plus would stick around our site for three minutes compared to one minute from Facebook or 20 seconds from Twitter. And that tells us that that's an influencer audience who is engaging in our content. So we ramped up our Google Plus strategy even though it was less of an audience, but it was the right kind of audience. Okay, great. Well, before we wrap up, uh, I need to mention to those of you who are here for your uh, Global Entrepreneurship uh, Week 
and you have your passports that I have a secret code to pass on to. It's NM8, Nickel Mike 8, NM8. So that's the number you have to write down, I guess, for your passport credit. Any last questions from anybody? So I want to thank our panelists very much for this, and I really appreciate everything about it. Have a good evening. <laughs>